Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. We want to say hi to all of our friends online, uh, wherever you might be watching from. We are so glad that you are joining us here today. We also want to say hi to our friends in the room. Is anyone fired up to be here this Sunday here in person? So glad that you're here. Hey, if it's your first time either in the room or online, we hope to see you again. And my name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point. Hey, we're going to launch today with why. The why it's so important that regardless of whether you showed up today kind of spiritually curious, maybe you grew up with some other different faith background, or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus all your life. There's a why it's so important that all of us are here this morning, and it's because of a truth that we've all experience that I'm going to put up on the screen, and it's this right here. Flawed people naturally create unavoidable friction. Remember last Sunday we talked about this. Remember last Sunday we talked about, listen, every family has dysfunction. There's no such thing as perfect people, so we all have defects. And listen, if you live in the real world, we're all going to have damage. Listen, flawed people will naturally create unavoidable friction. See, there's some myth that we bought into that if you love each other and if you're family, that you'll just not have any friction. It is unavoidable. But it often causes families to fracture. We all know this. Like we're flawed, right? But it leads to friction. And eventually this friction creates enough damage and families fracture. Listen, listen, you get this. If you're here and you're married, listen, it doesn't matter how much you love your spouse, right? Like, listen, if you're flawed and they're flawed, you're going to have, maybe because they're together, you're going to have friction, right? Listen, it doesn't matter how much you love your kid, and it doesn't matter how much your kid loves you. As a parent, you are flawed. As your kid is cute and is a chair bizarre, they're flawed, so you're going to end up with friction. It doesn't matter how much you love your brother or your sister and how awesome they are. If you're flawed and they're flawed, there's going to be, that's right, there's going to be friction. And I tried to go, hey, like when it comes to in-laws, right? Like you try to love your in-law, your in-law tries to love you, but if you're flawed and they're flawed, there's going to be friction. It doesn't matter how much you love your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents. If you are flawed, it is unavoidable to have friction. And this causes families to fracture. And this is why it's so important that regardless of whether we showed up with no faith, different faith, or we're a follower, it because of the following truth that is the whole idea behind our series, My Family Circus, and we're going to put it up on the screen. It's hard to win at life when we lose with our families, right? It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much accomplishments you have. It doesn't matter how much stuff you have. If you don't talk to your children when they get older, what good are all those things? It's hard to win at life when you lose with your family. If you have stuff, if you have money, if you have accomplishments, but your marriage falls apart and shambles, what good is it? It's hard to win at life when we lose with our family, right? Listen, when you have stuff and you have money and you have accomplishments, but you go to the holidays and no one speaks to other, it's hard to win at life when we lose with family. And that's why we're in the middle of this series. And listen, when we call it My Family Circus, listen, my family is a circus. Just ask my wife and kids because there's no such thing as normal. We're all flawed. That's why our second core value at South Point is everyone is loved and welcome because we all miss it. Now, the great news is if you're here today or online and you missed week one or two of this series, the good news is you can go to our website or our YouTube channel, and you can watch on demand whenever you would like to. Now, we want to return to the problem that we're all going to face and our families, and it's the fact that we're flawed, so we're naturally going to create unavoidable friction. And friction always causes damage. And here's why. I mean, listen, this, you already know this, right? Like, you've experienced this. This isn't new. You didn't have to come to church to learn this, right? Like, listen, when we experience friction with each other, right, when we are flawed and we create friction, we end up doing and saying things that we regret. I want to tell a true story on myself. This happened when my kids were young. This was decades ago with my wife. Um, my wife is amazing. She's a saint, and she's probably the reason we're still together. She's just awesome. I'm a moron, right? I love my wife, and so she's really easy to get along with, and I learned from growing up from the amount of abuse that I experienced that I try to use my words very wisely with my family, but for whatever day, uh, there was some friction. You know, we're both law. There's some friction, and man, we just got into it. I remember the exact room that we were in when we started having this friction. We were in the kitchen area, and I remember she was right next to the stove, and I was, I was close 
to the door. I can remember the sun was coming through. And I, I even forget what we were actually having friction and fighting over. But I remember I was so, so mad that I said the stupidest words that I probably have ever said to my wife. I pointed to the door. And I said, hey, there's the door. If you think you can do better, don't let it hit you on the way out, sister, because I'll be good. Am I clear? Now, I want you to know something. Had she walked out of the door, I probably would have started crying. Because outside of Jesus, my wife, Stephanie, is one of the greatest gifts ever given to me. And here's what you know, and here's what I know, here's what we all know, is that in the middle of friction, because we're flawed, all of us will do what's on the screen, and it's this. We do things we wish we could undo, and we say things we wish we could unsay. I bet there isn't a married couple in the room that hasn't done or said things they wish they could undo. I bet there isn't a parent online or in the room that hasn't done or said things to their kids they wish they would never, ever say. I bet there aren't any siblings in the room with brothers and sisters who don't wish there's some things that they could undo and some things they wish they could unsay. I bet there's some in-laws. I bet there's some aunties and uncles and some grandparents who probably have done and said things that they wish we could undo. Because here's the truth that we all know, right? Because we're flawed, right? We're just flawed. So you know what we're naturally going to do? Is we're going to create unavoidable friction. But in the middle of that friction, we're going to do and say things that cause damage. And when that damage builds up, you've experienced it. As soon as I started talking about this, you know of people that are fractured from your family. And the truth is, it's hard to win at life when we lose with our family. And it leaves you, whether you're online or in the room or wherever you're at, asking one of life's most important questions that we want to ask together this morning. And it's this right here. How do we, I need this, you need this, we all need this, right? How do we deal with friction so we don't cause unwanted fractures in our family? Listen, nobody, nobody goes to the altar and goes, man, I hope I mess this up. No one holds their newborn child and says, man, I hope when they get older, we don't speak together. When you're a little kid and you're playing with your siblings, you don't go, oh, I hope at our parents' funeral, we don't speak to each other. No one wants unwanted fractures. So how do we deal with the friction so that we don't do and say things? And when we do that, it doesn't cause fractures. This might be one of the most important questions that you and I would answer so that we could win with our family, so that we could win in life, regardless of where you are with your relationship with Jesus. This applies to everyone, no matter where you're at with faith. And this is the part I woke up before my alarm today because I think today I get to share some of the greatest news in all of human history. Matter of fact, this news is so great. It's why I took all the different chips of my life, right? And I put them all in a pile and I pushed all the chips of my life in to follow Jesus. And when I say to follow Jesus, I'm not talking about a church. I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about a person named Jesus. And here's why. Because God knew that you, God knew that I, God knew that we would struggle, that we would struggle with us. Listen, every family in every civilization in every century has created friction that has led to fracture. This was so important that Jesus himself addresses this because the answer isn't complicated. The answer isn't hard to find. The answer is actually something so simple and obvious, but not necessarily easy to do. Here's some more good news. Did you know that about 80 to 90% of the world's population, regardless of they're agnostic, atheist, or they have other faiths, about 80 to 90% of the world says, hey, I pray occasionally, like I pray. And I believe because at the heart of every human being, we were made to be in a relationship with our creator. And that's why we want to talk to him, right? That's what prayer is. So one day, Jesus was asked by the crowd around him, like, you know, hey, Jesus, is, you know, what does it look like to actually talk to God? What does it look like to pray? And so Jesus teaches people how to pray. But in the middle of teaching on people how to pray, Jesus gives you and I the solution to the question of how do we deal with friction in our families so that we don't fracture. We picked this up in the eyewitness account in Matthew, and Jesus speaks these words. No, go up, go back. You were right. Go back. Jesus says these words, forgive us the wrongs we have done. 
Like, like, listen, everyone gets this, right? Come on, listen. Whether you have no faith or different faith, listen, all of us here get it. We all miss it. Like, and I'm not just saying we fail or we kind of got it wrong. Listen, all of us have done, done dumb stuff, right? Can I just get an amen online or amen here, right? Like, listen, we all knew it was wrong and we did it anyway, right? So like the first part of this comes very natural to us, right? Like, hey, God, like, I just blew it. I just messed it up. I didn't mean to. Sometimes I did mean to. Would you please forgive us? Forgive me the wrong. Like the first part of this comes so naturally, right? Like we're all smiling. Yes, forgive us as we do. As we what? As we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Oh, no, he didn't. We laugh. But I can't tell you the number of stories of people have told me in their childhood, the abuse and the trauma that has created wounds that have lasted a lifetime. And it's broken your heart. And when Jesus says, forgive, you go, how do I do that? It broke my heart. And it breaks the heart of God. I've had people tell me about a promise that was made that was broken or betrayed, where there was hurt and abandonment. And you go, Jesus, you're telling me to forgive? And I want you to know it breaks God's heart. And his heart is broken that your heart is broken. For some of us, were family members in our lives that we were supposed to trust or, 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 or help us. And instead, because of greed or because of their own brokenness, they create hurt in our heart. And we go, we're supposed to forgive them? I mean, they did us wrong. And what they did breaks the heart of God. So we naturally get, yeah, God, forgive us. But when we get to this, as we forgive the wrongs of others, we go, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's unnatural and it's impossible because what they did was wrong. I can't, why in the world would we ever do that? And if we're really honest, whenever someone talks about forgiveness in Jesus, you know what we kind of do? Like, come on, come on, we, we can tell the truth in church, right? Here's what we do. We go, that's nice, Jesus. That's cute. Like, that's great for you, Jesus. Like, you're a God's son. Like, you can forgive, but you don't know what they did to me. And the reality is, is whatever it is that they did, it was probably wrong and it was probably bad. And you shouldn't or probably didn't deserve that. And you might be going, well, that's cute, Jesus. But Jesus uttered these words knowing one truth that changed all of time, all of human history, and all of eternity. Jesus knew that in a little bit, that of his 12 closest friends on planet Earth, one would betray him. The other 11 would abandon him. He knew that he would go through four trials where every time he was found innocent. But because of fear, because of envy, because of politics, did he be unjustly condemned. And then they ripped him naked, full of shame. And they beat him until he was unrecognizable. And then they spit on his face. And then as they nailed his hands to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. And then the only time in all of eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were separated as Jesus took all my brokenness, all your brokenness, all the world's sin, stuff we knew we were doing wrong, and he paid our price. So when Jesus says, forgive as we ask to be forgiven, he paid the price. He knew what he was asking because he loves you. But he doesn't just stop there. Because he knew as he was talking about prayer, God forgive us as we forgive those who sin against. He knew some people were like, oh, I missed that part, Jesus. I, I, I didn't hear that. So he wanted to make sure at the end, he goes on a little bit further and he makes sure he wants the crowd to know. He goes, listen, if you forgive others the wrongs they've done to you, your father in heaven will also forgive you. And this might be the scariest verse, but he says, but if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive you the wrongs you have done. See, here's the thing. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We, we get this, right? See, we often think when we don't want to forgive other people, it's about what they've done. You see, forgiveness isn't about what someone has done or hasn't done that they were supposed to do or not supposed to do. It's about what Jesus did on the cross because he loved you. See, forgiveness isn't based on what someone else did or didn't do. It's based on how much God loved us and the price that he paid to forgive us our sins. And the reason that God, Jesus tells us this is it's so important. It's because so many times we go to God and say, God, forgive me, but I'm going to hold a grudge, right? I'm going to hold something against one. It's because then we ask God to be a hypocrite. God, we want you to play favorites. Forgive me, but don't forgive them. Do you know how cray-cray they are? And then the other person's going, do you know how cray-cray they are? Like, listen, and so we try to ask God to play favors, and God is not a hypocrite. God is not unjust. 
Matter of fact, I love what the Apostle Paul is. This guy who used to persecute Christians until he encountered a risen Jesus. And there's this church in an ancient Roman city called Colossae. It was a church a lot like South Point. It was made up of some people who had never gone to church. It was made up of people who had come from pagan backgrounds or different faith backgrounds. Or some people who had grown up in kind of the Jewish faith, kind of in church, synagogue, all their life. And God is speaking to them through the Apostle Paul. And he writes these words in Colossians. It says, since you have been chosen by God, who has given you this new kind of life, and because of his deep love. Remember last week when we talked about what do we do with all of our family dysfunction? What do we do with our personal defects? What do we do with all the damage life's given us? We said, listen, before the foundations of the world, God chose you. God loved you in Christ Jesus. Listen, there's nothing anyone can do to you that can take away the value that you have before God or the inheritance that is coming because you are loved and chosen and concerned for you you should what's that word practice now church I'm, now, now if you're here and you're not like a follower you just get to eat popcorn right but for your church folk you're probably not gonna like me because you know what I like what he says he doesn't say no about this does he he doesn't say even believe it what does he say practice it now, church, do you think the world would be a little bit different if we did a little less knowing and a little less believing and a little bit more practicing? Practice tender-hearted mercy and kindness to others. I just got to say, man, like if you're a follower of Jesus and you're online, are you being tender-hearted? Are you being full of mercy and kindness to others? Are you practicing? Do you know something? Do you believe something? But is there any practice? And he goes on a little bit further, and he goes on to say this, listen, be gentle. Now, listen, I, I want to speak to all the fellows here, and, and, and I know this applies to the ladies, but mostly for men, we always feel like we've got to be rough and tumble. Listen, it takes more strength to be gentle when you actually have the strength to be angry or do something bad. It is strong. It is courageous. It, it is an act of courage to be gentle and ready to never holding grudges. I wonder how many of us show today are holding grudges against family members against people. Remember the Lord, he forgave you. Everything that we've done, everything that I've done, everything that you've done in the past, everything that we're currently getting wrong, everything that we're going to currently get wrong in the future, we've been forgiven. That's why on Sunday morning we show up and people are like, why do you guys sing songs? Man, we're fired up. We're happy. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But yet God chose and loved us before the foundations in this person named Jesus and all of our junk is forgiven and our inheritance is secure. Why wouldn't we worship Jesus? Y'all need some coffee. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And so you know what God tells us? God tells us the simple, easy solution to friction in our families. And here's what God tells us. Love. Love chooses to offer forgiveness instead of demanding payback. Isn't that exactly what God did for you and me? Right? I mean, God saw us and we rebelled. We did our own thing. And God could have demanded payback. But instead, God left heaven, put on a human suit, and was tortured, conquered hell and death. So that while it was free forgiveness to you and I, it cost him his only son. Because he, not out of love to bring us home, love chooses to offer forgiveness instead of demanding payback. Could you imagine if in our families we chose to offer forgiveness instead of demanding payback? Because see, really, the truth is there's only three options when it comes to friction in our families. Because we're all flawed. Like, ask ask my daughters, ask my wife, ask my siblings. Everyone in my family knows, hey, man, I'm as broken as they come. I need Jesus just like everyone else, right? So there's friction in our family. And so there's three options. One is we can just ignore the friction, but that's dysfunctional, and it'll still lead to fracture, right? Or we can get into the never-ending cycle of payback. You hurt me, so now I'm going to pay you back, but we're not really good at payback because we never get it equally right. We usually overpay back. Now they're offended and hurt, so they're going to hurt us again. And we get in the self-destructive cycle that just leads family to crumbles. So instead of ignoring it, instead of the never-ending cycle of payback, God tells us that we, in love, could choose to forgive. And here's what most of us are thinking, right? Like, here's what most of us are thinking. Like, we like the idea of being forgiven. And we even are okay with the idea of maybe I should forgive, right? 
But actually forgiving when we're hurt and when we're damaged and we feel overwhelmed, man, that, that's hard. And so there are three main obstacles that make forgiving hard, but we just need to be aware of. And so today, I want to be really honest. Each one of these three obstacles to forgiveness, they could be a whole message. But my goal today is just to briefly go over them. And I know whenever you hear a preacher say briefly, they're probably lying. Can I get an amen, right? I'm going to try to be brief. I'm going to try not to lie to you this morning, but if you do, could you forgive me? Thank you. So I'm going to briefly cover these, right, these three, these three kind of obstacles that we always face. And here's the first obstacle to forgiving is we often misjudge. And here's what I mean by we often misjudge. We judge ourselves by our intentions. I meant to. I was going to. I just had a bad day. Like if you knew my, we judge ourselves by our intentions, but we judge others by their. Come on now, church. See, the reason it's so hard to forgive people and so easy to ask God to forgive us is we go, God, you, you knew I was going to try better. You knew, you know I'm a knucklehead. You know, like, my intentions were good, but I just messed it all up, right? But, God, you should punish them because the only way that we judge them is their actions. We never know the story that's going on in life. We never know all the things. And so we have unfair scales. We misjudge and we think some people aren't worthy of forgiveness because we often judge ourselves by, well, I intended to, but judge them by their actions. And by the way, it's not only unjust, it's immoral. Matter of fact, there's a word for it. It's called being hypocritical. True story. A couple years ago, I had one of the worst birthdays that I've ever had. Like, it, it was nothing majorly bad happened. It's just my family just didn't really celebrate me well. I'm a, I'm a little bit needy. If you've ever met me, you know that's to be true, right? So I'm a little bit needy, but no one got me like a birthday present. No one even got me a card. Like they, they said happy birthday in the morning and like we had like a family dinner and, uh, but my, and my daughter made me a cake. If my daughter hadn't made me a homemade cake, which was banging by the way, thanks babe, you know which one you are, right? She made me this thing. But I literally went to bed on my birthday, right? Like I was angry. Like, I was so angry. I was like, my family don't love nobody. Well, I'm going to show them. I'm not going to love They want me to do stuff for them. Mm -mm, I'm going to get them back. Mm -hmm. Just Jesus-centered. Like, Jesus, be it. No, the exact opposite of that, right? And then I was reminded, God said, you remember like a decade ago, uh, you called home and you spoke to your wife? What happened? I go, oh, yeah, that's right. See, my wife also has a birthday, and a decade or so ago, I had called home, and I was talking to her about something, and she seemed off. And like husbands, I just want you to know, if something seems off, you just got to go, I'm sorry. I don't know what it is, but I, whatever it is, I'm sorry. I was like, hey, babe, is anything wrong? No. I'm like, babe, something sounds like it's wrong. No, I'm good. Like, babe, like, I'm so sorry. Like, what's going on? It's my birthday, and you didn't even wish me a happy birthday. No one got me anything. No one got me a card. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, babe. I'm so sorry life was so busy, right? And see, here's the truth. I judged my family by their actions, but I judged myself by my, and I was going to get them back. Now, there is something else about misjudging when it comes to forgiveness, is you can't give what you don't have. If we don't forgive ourselves, how can you give forgiveness? Now, this doesn't apply to everyone, but there are some of us in the room. Like, I got locked up as a young man. I did a bunch of horrible things. There are things I'll never tell another human being, things I'm so shameful for. And here's what I discovered. If I can't forgive myself and I don't let God forgive me, how can I give forgiveness? And there are some of you here in this room or online, your inability to forgive is because you won't forgive yourself. And for some of you, you might even be a follower of Jesus and God has forgiven you and yet you're taking God's place and won't forgive yourself. See, here's the reality. In your family, you can't give what you don't possess. And so either we misjudge by our intentions and their actions or we haven't forgiven ourselves and so we don't have anything to offer. Or we misunderstand what forgiveness is. And so I'm going to do the second thing that we do is forgiveness is not about being a doormat or denying, right? Because that's what many of us think, right? When we think about forgiveness, we're like, oh, I'm going to be a doormat. Listen, at South Point, we're going to do a whole sermon on boundaries. That's coming in a couple weeks because I get it. Listen, there are no perfect family members. We're all flawed. But if someone has a pattern of behavior where they consistently hurt you or they consistently do the wrong thing, that's not just direction. That's a pattern. Listen, there are no perfect people, right? So you're not supposed to be a doormat. And it isn't denying denying wrong. Listen, Jesus nowhere in the Bible called wrong right. What he did is say, I choose to forgive you because I'm going to die on the cross and conquer hell and death. Jesus was neither a doormat nor did he deny. When they came to arrest him, he says, I am he, and they all fell on their knees. Jesus says, don't worry about me. You don't have to have pity. I could call 12 legions. Forgiveness is not about being a doormat or denying wrong. Listen, when I was growing up, uh, 
it's been, it'll be two years this November that my grandmother, my biological grandmother, uh, passed away. I called her Nano. Nano was one of the few people in the world that I felt like she, I could fail. I could fall flat on my face. The world could hate me. And I could always go home to my grandmother and my grandmother would love me. And you might think, well, your grandmother's probably like soft. You ain't never met my grandma. My grandma was the kind of girl when we played cards, she would say hooray for me and to the heck with you. Like, I love Nano. I love my grandma. But what I love about grandma is, is Nano is that she was full of grace and forgiveness. I was about 19 or 20. <laughs> I went to go see my grandma and I went to spend time with her. And it was late at night, and this is kind of back in the day when cable's new. And if you're a young man and you're stupid, uh, I tried to order an inappropriate movie, and God gave me grace and protected my eyes and my heart because I couldn't figure out how to get it to work. And that was just kind of a, a really poor, bad choice, right? And so anyway, a couple weeks later, I get a call from grandma. And I'm like, hey, grandma. She's like, yes, yeah, my life. She goes, great. She goes, hey, I got the cable bill. And I was like, oh, crap. I know what's coming. And she said, hey, there was this movie on there. And I go, I know, Grandma. And she goes, hey, we're never going to do that again, right? Yes, Grandma, we're never going to do it again. And you know what? She never brought it up, and she never made me feel shameful. And what I love about my grandma is she wasn't a doormat. She didn't deny. If it's not doormat and not deny, then, like, then what is it? But before we go, I want to talk about this. Forgiveness doesn't remove the truth of restor- restitution. Listen, if you're here... And you slandered somebody. Say you went onto Facebook or Instagram and you slandered someone, but you found out you were wrong. Well, restitution would mean is you don't just apologize and ask for forgiveness. You actually try to make it right by going around and making sure everyone knows that you got it wrong and they're good. If you're here and you've ever broken a promise or broken trust or you did something where you took something that belonged to you, restitution is appropriate. Well, then what is the meaning of forgiveness, which is kind of the third but like brief point is, is this. We give to others the free pass from payback that God offers us, right? Because isn't that what we want when someone hurts us, right? When someone hurts us, when someone does us dirty, when someone does us wrong, they hurt us. What we want is not restitution. We want vengeance. I, I was hanging out with some friends, and someone said, yeah, I, I, don't, get, I, I, don't, I don't worry about those things. I get even. I was like, whoa, that's a little bit dangerous, right? Like, that's what we want. We want payback. We give others the free pass from payback that God offers us. See, it is free. We get a free pass from payback from God because it costs God his only son. See, the amazing thing is that God forgives us freely, though it costs him everything. And isn't that what we should do for others? is freely give back what was given to us. True story, I have two daughters. My oldest daughter had a birthday party when she was a little kid. And she has a grandparent, and the grandparent came and bought her this gift. You have to understand, when my daughter was young, she was really tall and like the 96th percentile. So she was a little bit clumsy. And my grand, you know, her grandfather had bought her a present. My father-in-law, right, bought her a present. And, you know, he had, had some family dysfunction. He experienced a lot of damage in life. And like all of us, he's defective, right? And so he was just, he was, he was like, if I was totally honest, like he, he was being a little bit of a jerk. So my wife had to like jump in. And then when the wife jumps in, I have to jump in. I'm like, hey, 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 grandpa, like we can't, we can't do that. You know, you're going to hurt. You know, she's crying. And to this day, my oldest daughter's memory of her grandfather is that he's just an angry person. And my daughter and I were having a conversation. I said, don't you understand? He had so much dysfunction, so much damage. God has freely forgiven us. We should pass along and give the free payback that God offers us. Forgiveness is a choice and healing is a process. So many times I talk to people that go, I feel like I forgave him, but I have all these feelings. Listen, forgiveness isn't about feelings. Forgiveness is a choice where you choose to go, I'm not going to ask God to strike them dead. I'm going to choose not to extract payback or vengeance from that family member who hurt me or wounded me. But the healing from that wound, the healing of those feelings, well, that's a process. I love what one famous pastor from our current generation, his name's Andy Stanley. When it comes to we give others the free pass from payback that God gave us, he says, in the light of our circumstances, the pain that was given to us, forgiving another feels like we're rewarding evil. But in light of the cross and the suffering and the penalty that in love God paid for us, it's one undeserving soul passing along a free gift that we were given that was unearned. And that's why Jesus says, as we ask for forgiveness, we should forgive those. 
And if I was going to sum it all up in one sentence, and some of you are like, bro, you should have started there, right? Like if I was going to sum it all up, I'd sum it up this way. The solution to the friction in families is the free gift of God's forgiveness. Again, there's going to be friction. There's no amount of love. There's no amount of goodness. Like, listen, we're all broken people. If you're going to be in family, you're going to have a family circus. Just say amen. You just type in family circus, right? Like we're family. We're busted. There's going to be friction. But the awesome thing is there's a free gift. It's free to you and I. It's called forgiveness. Now, it costs God his only son. That we pass on to each other. And here's the amazing thing. Forgiveness creates instead of the payback cycle, instead of the ignoring dysfunctional cycle that creates fractures and separates families where people at funerals do not talk to each other, at weddings and holidays where people treat each other poorly and won't talk, instead of the payback or ignoring, forgiveness creates restored relationships instead of ruined relationships because you know this i know this and we know this it's hard to win in life if you lose with your family and i want to close with a true story uh it's a little bit embarrassing it's my story and i love telling crazy stories about me so you guys actually believe that like jesus can work with knuckleheads right and so if he works with the chief knucklehead he can obviously do amazing things in your life uh, gosh, this was, this was, man, this was years ago. Uh, my girls were little. My wife and I had just moved here uh, from a different state to work with this organization called Young Life. And if I told you the salary I was getting paid, you would go, how did you and your wife actually live and eat on that salary? And we had uh, people who were generous who brought us groceries, but we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, we had two young kids. And my job was working with high school students. And I don't know if you've ever met me, but I'm competitive when it comes to any kind of game. I don't really care what kind of game it is. I want to win. And I'm really not like Jesus when I do that. So anyway, I was working with high school kids, trying to get them to know Jesus. And a couple of these high school kids play tennis. I like playing tennis. It was a way for me to build a relationship with them. And so I was barring rackets and I wanted to be better than them and beat them because that's what Jesus wants you to do is beat high school kids that you're leading to Jesus. And so I wanted to buy a tennis racket. And you had to understand this, a tennis racket, a good tennis racket, back in the day was well over $100. And my wife and I talked about it. So I'm going to get this tennis racket because like it's ministry. It's a ministry tool. She's like, "Uh uh-huh. My wife ain't no dummy. She's like, hey, babe, like we can either eat food or you can buy a tennis racket. You know, just go ahead and look at your children. Tell them which one you want. I was like, well, great. They they need to to lose a little bit of weight. They'll be great. They'll be fine. (laughs) Really great parenting there, right? So we agreed that I couldn't uh, couldn't do it. But you know what I did? Uh, I was a really bad husband. I went ahead and bought the tennis racket anyway. And so whenever I'd go play tennis with the high, yeah, mm, I told you, man, like I need Jesus really bad, right? So I would go out to play tennis with the kids and I'd sneak it out. And one day I was trying to sneak out with the tennis racket and she noticed it. Uh Uh-oh. Now, if you're married and you get busted, do not lie. You're just adding gas to the fire. Once you've been busted, you just, you just, just confess. Like, that's the best thing to do is confess, right? That's free advice. You don't have to add anything extra and offer, right? She goes, what is that? I go, it's a tennis racket. She goes, it looks like a new tennis racket. It is. I go, I, I bought a tennis racket. And she just looked at me, and I'll never forget the look, because it wasn't one of, like, anger. It was one of sadness, where she said, babe, I, I really want you to have the tennis racket. I didn't say no to the tennis racket because I don't want you to have something nice. It's, we can't afford it. We have to do without because you chose to be selfish. And I'm grateful that over the last 27 years, my wife has passed on the God-forgiven grace that she's received, and she's passed it into our marriage so that our family won't fracture. Because no matter how much you, no matter how much they love you, whether you're married or whether you're a parent or they're a child or a sibling or an in-law or an auntie or uncle, we're all flawed. It will result in friction. And we're only left with three solutions. We can ignore it, and that'll create dysfunction. We can do the payback cycle. That leads to dysfunction. Or we can choose what God has given us as a free gift. To forgive as we're forgiven. Because without that, families fracture. And you know it, and I know it. It's hard to win at life when we lose with our families. Let me pray for us. Hey, God, you're awesome. God, when we were knuckleheads, God, when we chose to do that thing, we knew it was wrong. We chose to rebel. When we chose to stiff arm you, God, and cause you hurt and pain, instead of seeking payback, God, you left heaven. And Jesus, you paid the most horrible price to bring us home. Love chose forgiveness over payback. 
God, I pray that if we're here and we're reminded of a grudge that we have with a family member, God, that we would choose to forgive that. God, I pray for anyone online, or God, I pray for anyone in the room that has not received your forgiveness, that they would simply say yes to you by admitting that we miss it, by believing in you, Jesus, and committing to surrender every day so that we can receive forgiveness that we can pass along. Because before the foundations of the world, God, in your goodness, you loved us, And you chose us in Christ Jesus, even though we're busted and broken. Because we were meant to be a part of your family. We are so grateful for this. We love you and thank you. And pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen.